Right, so I farm, I graze cattle in St. Albans. And I dairy farmed up there for about seven years, and now I'm grazing beef cattle. Grazing beef cattle gives me more time to work on other projects like soil carbon challenge and stuff in the winter and so forth. But I started in the desert in Arizona where it kind of became clear to me that community health and economics and land health, it's all one thing. And I remember having a thought one day that was, uh, where did all the organic matter in this soil go? Because I was sitting on a bunch of sand. And I was aware of climate change in the early 90s and was even studying it. And then I ran across a paper by a guy named Alan Yeomans, the son of P.A. Yeomans, who invented the key line system of soil formation and landscape design. I think we'll touch on some of that today. And Alan, this son, pretty much has spent most of his adult life putting together the connection between soil and climate. And it's a really important connection because there is uh, carbon, nitrogen, water, and other stuff cycling between the atmosphere and soils. And, it's, and that cycling, it's a, it's a big positive miracle. It's the cycle of the carbon cycle, it's a cycle of life, birth, growth, death, decay. And it's sort of a little bit broken right now. So that's when I first found out about holistic management. Holistic management is a decision-making framework um, with probably the most visible aspect being a grazing planning procedure, managing big herds of livestock to simulate wild herds of ungulates being pursued by predators, to recreate the conditions that under which the grasslands on earth evolved and created the best soils on earth. And Alan Savory figured out how to reverse desertification using this. So ideas like key line, soil formation, and holistic management, and actually quite a few dozen others have been informing my thinking for a long time now. And what it gives me is a lot of hope because we can rebuild soils and we're sort of low on soil, so our soil tank is low and I've been putting a lot of stuff t to the test on the farm up in St. Albans and uh, somebody said if I knew if I farmed half as well as I knew how to farm I'd be one hell of a farmer <laughs> <laughs> so this is a reality that you know all this study and so forth is worthwhile and then there's only so many hours in the day it's why it makes me really excited that people like Stan and Helen are starting a farm here, but they're starting really knowledge rich. They're, they're really digging into the information and and kind of going whole hog with things out here. Like they're, they're pushing boundaries already and they've been in at it like a month or so. <laughs> <laughs> but one of the things that I've suffered from is a lack of monitoring or starting with monitoring that I wasn't able to follow up with because I had faulty design or, and whatnot. And monitoring, not only is, I'm not just monitoring so I can sell carbon or something like that, I'm, I'm monitoring so I can learn, or this is why I wanna do monitoring, so I can see if I'm actually making progress, so that I can compare apples to apples with peers and see, you know, say, well, I did this and this and this, and this is what happened to the soils. And they say, well, I did this and that, and this is what happened. And we, be, we need to learn because if the oil age is winding down, a friend, Jim Laurie, Lor, excuse me, coined the phrase, uh, the soil age. We've got to land somewhere in the soil age. is probably a good place to do that. But we're landing on a low soil tank. There's not much. And so I think that really the biggest job of our time is rebuilding the soils of the world. And the people who are there are the grazers and the farmers and let's count the foresters too but we're the we're the interface between the rest of society and the landscape and the soil in this the soil in this in, in this uh, or the carbon in the soil so we've got a lot of work to do and if we're going to do that it's really biology is really complicated and we're going to need to monitor to be able to learn effectively and perhaps to re work the systems of incentive. We're incentivized to burn off soil carbon right now. It makes sense to move into uh, the California Delta and burn off 20 feet of soil because you can grow a lot of crops by burning off, burning off through oxidation just by keep plowing that soil, having it interact with oxygen, release minerals that grow plants. There's incentive to do that because we're paid just for 
the crops that we produce. But if I change or if I improve the soils, let's say on my little farm, I'm going to affect a lot of things. I'm going to affect the atmospheric gas ratios and water vapor, nitrogen, carbon dioxide. I'm going to affect flooding, drought, wildfire, water quality. I'm going to affect the biggest pool of biodiversity on Earth is in soils. I'm going to affect biodiversity on Earth, which is a big part of what makes the Earth go round. Um, all of those things I just mentioned, we spend zillions of dollars, jillions even, <laughs> every year on uh, addressing these problems that in a lot of ways actually come from an ineffective carbon cycle or topsoil loss. And so we can keep spending those jillions probably forever, or we could turn to, well, how do we rework economics so that farmers were incented beyond just doing the right thing ethically while the rest of society drives BMWs and we drive old pickups? <laughs> um, how, how can we incent things so that these farmers can be rewarded for providing the clean water or the flood regulation? Here in Vermont, even though not a lot of our land is in agriculture, Maybe half a million acres in Vermont are actually directly tilled or grazed. Um, but still, that's a lot of land. And if that land were more absorbent, we would have had less flooding after Irene. And I was in St. Albans this summer for the longest drought we've ever had. And if that land had more organic matter in it, we could have kept growing crops longer into that dry spell and so forth. So I keep experimenting with this stuff up on the farm. And we've had some exciting changes. I'm looking forward though to more monitoring uh, for me to learn faster and for me to be able to compare notes with my neighbors and for Vermont to start thinking about farms not as just as some like quaint relic of the past and we want to preserve a working landscape that's interesting but actually the future of Vermont depends on having lots of carbon in our soil our economics depends on it the way that our watersheds function depends on it our security in the face of weather extremes depends on it, like big dumps of rain and whatnot. And if we can keep thinking outward, I think it's really good to think at the farm or the watershed scale. But we can keep thinking outward to the atmosphere and we can you know, change the future prospects vis-a-vis -vis climate change. I mean, we could, the math actually indicates that a small increase in soil carbon on worldwide ag and grazing land can take the extra atmospheric carbon and pull it into the soil. That's a pretty positive thing. And I, I, I don't even think about it. It's so normal to me. I know that we can reverse global warming, so to speak, and that we can clean our water, and that we can reverse desertification, and that we can grow food without lots of pesticides, fertilizer, herbicides. We can manufacture all those things right out of the air. We don't do it. The plants and the microbes do it, but we can let it happen through our management. So I'm very hopeful and I think it means a lot to Vermont on a real practical level that our future is directly tied to how much carbon is in our soils and figuring out how to turn air through plants and microbes into soil organic matter is the big job in front of us. And it's going to need economics attached to it, but we have to start somewhere. And I think that monitoring in the soil carbon challenge is really a great place to, if not start, then at least just bump things up to the net to the next stage.